This episode of Generally Famous includes discussion of depression and suicide. If you or anyone you know needs help with their mental health, a range of organisations can help. This includes the 1737 service, which offers free help from a trained counsellor by calling or texting that number 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally famous for saving Kiwis thousands. Call into one of the stores or visit online at tradedepot.co.nz. Kia ora, aotearoa, and welcome to Generally Famous. I'm Simon Bridges, and every week I talk to generally famous, but always interesting guests about life, love, and what makes them tick. Today, multi-award winning journalist, author, speaker, storyteller, mental health advocate, and much, much more. Shahan Kassanada, it's great to have you. Thank you, Simon. I'm already regretting saying yes to this. <laughs> I'm already getting the creeps and you haven't even asked me the first question because no. I don't like I don't like being in this position. I like being in your position and being in control and getting to ask the Does questions. it happen happen much that you are on yeah. the receiving end? Well, I've had to learn how to do that in the last couple of years yes. as I've come out and shared my own mental health journey yeah. and talked more openly about some of the things that I've struggled with in my life. So it's been a really big taste of my own medicine because I'd spent so many years as a journalist being on the other side of the table, but it's given me such a new understanding of what we ask of people when we say, share your story. You know, storytelling has really become a buzzword in our culture. We want authentic storytelling. We want people to bring their whole selves to work. But I think we don't fully understand the true cost of that and how exposing and scary that can feel when you put yourself out there. What What is this, and obviously I have a sense of this because we're in a modern age where everyone talks about, but what is authenticity? I mean, what is it a bit overdone? Well, maybe it's that we've lived in a capitalist society for a long time where you spend your day getting spun to, marketed to, advertised Mm. to. People are trying to constantly sell you not just products and services, but also versions of themselves. And for me, growing up as a digital native, as part of the social media generation, I think we realised when we were in our mid-teens, none of this is really real. Yes. So now, and it's gone the other way, where businesses have realised they can capitalise on this idea of authenticity. Yes. But the more you capitalise on it, the less authentic yeah. it actually seems. I suppose, I suppose, and this is an incredibly cynical, negative <laughs> place to start this discussion, but I suppose what I think, or yeah, think, is that oftentimes the ones that people say, oh, they're so authentic, are... Uh, often less authentic because, in fact, it's a show about there, and I know this is an overused, value-laden term, but it's the one that comes to me right now, because they're virtue signalling. You know, yeah. they're like, oh, you know, I'm da, 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 da. yes, I, I saved the puppy on the road and I'm doing this, that and the other thing. And, and as you say, with corporates, you know, whether it's greenwashing or, you know, gender washing, if that's a new term, but yeah. Well, even mental health. And I think yes. that was one of the things that I was really reluctant about when I decided to share my own journey through depression and suicidality. I didn't want people to think, oh, he's just another one of these media types who's come out and is talking about their problems. Is he doing it for publicity? Is he doing it for some kind of personal gain? So I think that you're right. There is a level of cynicism out there. But the value of those stories far outweighs the negative, in my view. I think that's right. And and I suppose it's also, um, it's like so many things. And as another um, guest on Generally Famous retorted to me when we were talking this sort of, having this sort of discussion, you know, there is a seesaw in these things, right? And so... You know, it doesn't need to be one extreme or the the other. New Zealanders are not good at telling their stories. Mm. And that sounds incredibly blunt, but I've spent, you know, 15 years trying to help people to articulate themselves. And when you sit down with a bunch of cameras and microphones, I accept that that's an incredibly artificial environment to do that. That's not normal for most people. But you look at other cultures. I've just spent a couple of weeks in New York, and I know that Americans are kind of an extreme example. Well, they're over-disclosers, aren't they? Yeah, they're probably over-sharers. But there is something really, I find, inspiring and energising about the way in which they back themselves, the confidence that they have to put themselves out there. And, you know, I I hate to come back to tall poppy syndrome because I think that's often used as a bit of a a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's the same with political correctness. You know, those types of terms are overused. 
but I just haven't got to the nub of why it is that Kiwis are so reluctant to be open, to be real, and to even use that word authentic, you know? I I definitely agree with you. And um, and of course, what, what some of that means in New Zealand, and yeah, it's, it's changing and that's good, um, but um, the Kiwi bloke is kind of, you know, they might have their limb falling off them or something you ask them how they are I'm okay I'm 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 go it's, it's okay we'll be we'll get there you know and it rather because they don't open up and say what's going on but the funny thing with that is I feel that in many contexts in our country that's an outdated stereotype so if you look at mental health one of the things that frustrates you should, you me... should meet some of my former colleagues. Well, but. fair enough. Yeah, well, another argument for more diversity in the National Party. But uh, there is a lot of... Uh, when you're standing. No, 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 like, don't answer that. Keep, keep moving. There are a lot of pockets of our society that have different kinds of men. Men who haven't come from a farming background, men who don't play rugby. And yeah. it really irritates me that we talk to men as if they're stupid. Because we have this belief that men are stoic and they don't ask for help and they don't talk about their emotions and they're not connected with their emotional lives, we give them content that's incredibly oversimplified. It's like we don't trust them with being able to process and understand so what's your So um, what's your view on the state of the current... Of masculinity in New Zealand and Aotearoa, New Zealand and this time. Well, I grew up trying to work out what does it involve to be a good man. And when I was at school, we were just starting to experience the early part of this conversation around toxic masculinity. That conversation was overdue because we had generations of patriarchy and generations of um, men basically getting to set the rules. And so we needed that. But I think the problem is... We've identified that toxic masculinity is a problem, and I think we all know what toxic masculinity looks like. We know that we need to teach boys about consent. We need to teach them about respect and all of that stuff. But while we're trying to dismantle toxic masculinity, we haven't got a story about what healthy masculinity looks like. So we really have this vacuum in our culture where we're saying to young boys and young men, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But we're not actually painting a hopeful picture of here is what it looks like to be a healthy, functioning man mm. in this current cultural context. So where do they get that from? Well, they get it from celebrity culture, they get it from Instagram, yes. they get it from porn. Yeah. So... And I think that's partly because this has become such a politically charged issue is that if someone, if I was to say to you, well, let me ask you this, what does what healthy masculinity look like to you? Um, look, you know, it's a very complicated it's one. It's a tricky I mean, one. Let, 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 me, let me answer you on the toxic masculinity. I don't dislike that phrase, right? I've written about it myself. Um, but I... But some people do. They hate it. So I'm not in that camp. But I do think it's a bit like some of the other ones we've mentioned. Authenticity, you know, da 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 da. A bunch of other sort of catch cries of of our time. They can be overused. And there is definitely toxic masculinity. But what I think critics would say, and I go some way with this, is that what's also true is men being competitive isn't bad. Men... Um, um, being physical isn't bad, right? Yep, there's yeah. bad men. And, and and I suppose the concern is that in our country today, if we're not careful, it's kind of like um, female, feminine, um, that way of viewing things and talking about that, we're really comfortable, that's amazing, Um but, you know, um, anything that's sort of male, masculine, we've got to be a bit careful of because that's a bit sort of, I don't know if it's political or socially, a bit squiffy, right? And I think we have to be careful about that. I'm really on a roll right now. I sound I like Jordan Peterson, but uh, it's yeah, like... Yeah, you're going full, full noise, but, but, Jordan you know, Peterson. But, there are, but there, are issue, there are issues um, that men have around lower attainment in education, Absolutely. homelessness and so on that... You, you, 
make this this whole area, I don't know what I'm saying, but well, problematic. Well, in, injuries at work, mental health, oh. suicide rates. You know, we have serious, serious issues with men's health in general in this country. So a lot of the issues that I've spent time covering over the last few years are things like eating disorders in men, childhood sexual trauma in men. So I think it's a widely known statistic that one in six women have experienced uh, sexual violence or sexual trauma. Um, and the figure is also very high for men. It's not as high as that, but we don't talk about that because we think, well... Or male uh, domestic family violence. Yeah, I mean, and so look, the the important caveat here, and this is where this gets into tricky territory, is because some people will say, well, you know, there are far more women who are suffering from these issues, and actually this is about writing the balance. It's writing the scales because women's voices haven't heard for a long time, haven't been heard for a long time. So, look, I, I think it is complex, and I think the stories that are being told in our culture around issues like sexual violence are absolutely vital. But why does it have to be an either-or? Why can't we also create space for men to talk about what they're struggling with and to open a conversation where we can explore this stuff in a safe way where people aren't going to be torn down for what they say? Let's change pace for a second. You, you um, grew up in Wellington. Yes. Are you emotionally scarred as a result of that? Absolutely not. I moved back to Wellington <laughs> from Auckland because I was emotionally scarred from living in Auckland for three oh, or four years. Yeah. Could that be so? Well, I found Auckland a really hard city, actually. I moved up here to work on the Sunday Current Affairs program in 2016, which was my dream job, having watched those journalists growing up for a long time, and they'd travelled the world and covered wars and broken stories, and so I was really fortunate to be given the opportunity to work on that show at the age of 26. But I struggled up here because I think I found it hard to find my place. I found it hard to find my people. I was at that interesting age around 26, 27, where you've moved out of university and those years where there's heaps of people around and it's all fun and games. And now life has got a bit more serious. People have settled into their careers. A lot of my friends had got married and had kids and I wasn't in that stage of life. And so I moved up here for this job and I worked incredibly hard over that four years, but I found it tough. And so the reason that I moved back to Wellington is that's where my connections were. That's where my uh, parents were and some of my closest friends. But I love Wellington. I think Wellington gets a bad rap. I must. I have a, fe- a female ex-journalist friend who was up here from Wellington, and um, they had a similar experience. Actually, I think you know. Of course, there's others who've thrived and loved They've it. Toughed it out. Is Maybe. Wellington though a different? I, I, I you know, you, you know, challenge me on this, but you know, I'm, uh, as I think Jerry Brownlee once famously said, I'm just asking the questions. <laughs> um, is Wellington different from everywhere else in New Zealand? How so? Well, it's filled with bureaucrats. They earn certain salaries. Um, they have a view of life. Um, they're Go to not Cuba back Mall. in the office. Go to Cuba Mall. There's no bureaucrats in Cuba Mall. There's lots oh, of nice little I bet there are. boutique cafes. No, you're right, because they're all on the golf courses. <laughs> They they're all at, they're all, they're all doing it at the driving range. They are not Monday ten a.m. The, not the golf driving ranges have never done better. No, look, there's a lot of hard work, hard working people in Wellington who've propped this country up during the pandemic, Simon. So we've got to give them credit. But I, but team, Wellington, it's a team of five million. That's right, huh? It is a team of five million. And actually, uh, someone once said that Wellington is a heart without a city, and Auckland is a city without a heart. <laughs> and I think that's probably right. That's quite good. I like that. I don't. I'm, I want to be offended, but I feel like there's something in there. And look, you, in all seriousness, your parents are from Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. Um, you grew up in the hut. Yes. Um, what What was that like? I was a really curious kid. My dad was a journalist. He'd worked uh, in Sri Lanka for a long time, and that's why my parents left, because it wasn't safe. There was a civil war that was underway there, and they moved to New Zealand to start a family and a new life. And I grew up in, I guess, a pretty typical migrant family in that my parents both worked very hard to provide a new life for my brother and I. Mm -hmm. My grandma lived with us when we were growing up and was like a third parent to us, which was um, hugely enriching. My dad realised when he started working at the Dominion in the 90s that actually the media industry was shrinking. Amazing how much it's shrunk in the last couple of decades since then. But he wanted to sort of future-proof his career, and so he started to retrain as a lawyer. And so for eight years during my childhood, 
he uh, went to Victoria University and studied law part-time during the day and then at 5.30 at night would go to the Dominion and work as a sub-editor till 1.30 in the morning. Wow. And that is the classic migrant mindset, right? Yeah. It's not about your own satisfaction. It's not about your own comfort. It's about how do I provide the best quality of life for my family. And so that was the environment that I grew up was in. Was it a reasonably intellectual, academic kind of household? It was or? a very social justice-oriented household. Right. So we talked a lot about issues and people and how people were being treated. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people in our family who've, who've done great things in the community and, and in society. So I, I think that was infused into me from an early age. People often ask me if I was pushed into journalism or whether it was in the blood or whatever. I don't know about that. But um, if anything, I was told by my dad how tough the media industry was. Mm. But I used to just sit there and watch the TV. The TV was like this incredible magical box in the corner of the room. And I think for younger people today, and I'm sounding like the old man sitting on the porch now at the age of 32. Um, oh, great age. Young people can't. In your prime. <laughs> young people. I went to parliament at 32. Sorry. Did Keep you? Keep going, yes. Okay, well, maybe I need to speed up my career progression. Not that I'm going to parliament. Don't misinterpret that. Stuff will go and turn that into a headline or something, say that I've announced political Jihane aspirations. Kisanada. MP for no, Rimitaka. Never. No, absolutely not. That would never happen. Um, and, and Chris Hipkins has got a job for life there anyway. Um, I, I watched TV and I thought, this box is taking me to all these amazing places around the world, whether it's a travel show, whether it's the news, whether it's watching the, I don't know, you know, watching the coverage of Princess Diana's death and thinking, this is incredible. And so I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be there for those big events. I wanted to get to see the world and meet people in different states of uh, distress and also triumph. And so that's what drew me to journalism. I want to talk to you more about that. I just want to ask you this, though, about your upbringing. Mm. Uh, minority, ethnic minority, immigrant parents, your story, does that affect your view around being a Kiwi? Mm. I, I mean, it obviously does. I suppose the question is how. How? I, it, I definitely struggled with my own identity as a kid, trying to straddle two different You're cultures. You're conscious of being brown? Absolutely. Up. I mean, the story that I always tell is, and it's burnt into my mind, is from when I was five or six years old and I was standing on the corner of the school field one day with a girl called Olivia who said to me, are you brown because you don't shower? And that memory only came back to me in counselling that I did like 20 years later. And I thought, why is that still there? I don't remember the context. I don't remember the rest of the day. But it's lodged there because it was a traumatic memory. And it was probably one of the first times that I realised that I was different to everyone else. And so I felt um, there was something wrong with my skin colour. I felt like there was something wrong with my body because I was skinny and I didn't play sports very well and I was bullied. And so it was the layers of all those things, plus growing up in a culture where I didn't see people like myself on TV. You know, New Zealand media, as much as people complain about it, is now so much more reflective sure. of our country uh, than it was. It still has a fair way to go. But I, I was quite an anxious kid. I was trying to find my place in the world. On the question of race, it's somewhat topical uh, in the period we're in, and I've been thinking about it myself. Do, do you think, because there's a very polarised set of views on this, do you think if you're an ethnic minority, let's say politician, um, that your race um, could be uh, held against you, I suppose, is the uh, the point I make. Yeah, absolutely. we've seen it in the mural campaign and uh, Fesso Collins uh, in Auckland a, a while back, uh, uh, saying so, saying he thought that was in the polling, and a bunch of people foo fooing that. Here is the only um, person who can tell you about whether they're experiencing racism or unconscious bias, and that is the person themselves. So. Whenever I talk about this topic of race or culture or diversity and I write a stuff piece or I do another piece of media, I get a torrent of social media messages and emails from people who say, you are beating this up. Yes, there might be a couple of odd examples of racism in our country, but it's not as widespread as you might think. And what I would say to that is, if you are in the majority, if you are not used to seeing or noticing this, if it's not your inbox that's being filled with those types of messages, of course you're going to be oblivious to that. I don't expect a white man in his 50s to know or observe or see what that prejudice 
looks like. And the whole point of unconscious bias is that it's unconscious. So if I think, if I look at the totality of my career, and I've, look, I've had amazing opportunities. I worked for TVNZ for a long time. I was very well treated by TVNZ. Um, are, there, are there opportunities? Are there media roles that I have applied for or been interested in where I thought, oh, did I not get that because of my race, for starters, I would never put it down to that one factor. Sure. But it might be part of a package of factors that without the person hiring even recognising mm. may have influenced their decision. So I think it's really complex, and I don't think it's as simple as saying, was this particular decision or vote um, based on race or racism? I don't think you can really answer that cleanly. It's just a sense that you get from the conversations that you have with people. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I'm, I remember listening on to a Hard Talk uh, interview with a very senior Singaporean uh, politician, cabinet minister. I think uh, he was Indian and uh, ethnically, and, you know, he was um, he was being asked about this. And I think his point fundamentally, which I think, you know, is a hard truth. It doesn't sound good when said aloud, but there's something in is that people do on the whole, as a tendency, and there's plenty of counterexamples, I get that Barack Obama vote for people that look like them. Absolutely. Right? And so that is a phenomenon there. Well, the warm weather has finally arrived, and that means outdoor living, looking for cooler indoors, and breaking out possibly the tool belt for all your DIY and home improvement projects. Yep. You might be one of the many thousands of Kiwis thinking about those home improvement jobs. Trade Depot is your one-stop shop, whatever you're up to. With over 4,500, that's right, 4,500 quality home improvement projects across bathrooms, kitchens, appliances, and much, much more, Trade Depot has you sorted for any project. And most appliances have a two-year warranty. Trade Depot is 100% New Zealand owned. They understand where you're coming from. They believe you don't have to pay a premium for good quality products. But neither should you throw your money away on low quality items. And the more you spend, the more you save. Get 4% off orders over two and a half grand and up to 8% off orders over $8,000. T's and C's apply. Get more bang for your buck with low prices always at Trade Depot. Check out tradedepot.co.nz or call into one of their three stores, Auckland, Christchurch and the new superstore in Hamilton near the airport. Um, journalism, you, you, you've already given me a bit of this, but you wanted to be, which some would say is kind of weird, a journalist oh. from the age of four. You you, <laughs> you then um, were at homes at, uh, on homes at 13. You were yeah. writing for the Sunday Star Times um, at 15, mm. at breakfast TV 17. Mm. As you say, you've had, a, I think, a, over a dozen years on, on the likes of breakfast, close-up, seven sharp Sunday. Mm. You've won a string, actually more than a string, strings of... The, the most prestigious uh, awards. My question to you is, what, what did you, you no longer in it, um, what did you like about journalism? It's the opportunity to, and it sounds a bit cliche, but witness history, but also help to write history, you know, because you're not sitting there as a passive, passive observer. I think the very traditional idea of journalism being this um, objective thing that comes from on high mm is not realistic. And that's a really difficult point because one of the things that um, journalism schools continue to teach is this idea of balance. And this is controversial because balance, to me, often implies that there's there's two sides to a story and there's 50% on this side and there's 50% on the other. But often you realise that there's 10 sides to a story or there's 100 sides to a story or there's a whole bunch of people that could stand around an issue or a topic and would come to a very different conclusion. So journalists are by their nature subjective because yes. they're human beings. You can't turn off your own prejudices and your own worldview and your own values. I can't yes. switch off my culture. I can't switch off the fact that I'm male. Now, my job, and, and I'm not comparing it to these professions, but I imagine similar to a police officer or a judge, you've got a professional set of obligations for you as a, as a lawyer. 
And your job is as much as possible to set aside your own views and your own life experience and discharge your duty as objectively as possible. Um, but I think we also need to acknowledge that, yeah, not every story is as, as simple as we might like to make it. And, you know, where this has got into dangerous territory in some ways is because journalists are now, in many media organisations, not even expected to be completely objective. They're expected, and I would say this is the opposite, to have a personality, to build a relationship with the audience, to have a social media profile, to become a celebrity in and of themselves. So the job of being a journalist, the expectations have changed quite significantly. You know, when I started in current affairs, I was wearing a suit and tie, and you'd turn up at a farm wearing a suit and tie, whereas the whole direction that our media has gone on and gone towards in the last few years is how do we personalise our storytellers? You're shunned these days if you do wear a tie. That's right. It's I weird. feel like a dinosaur. Um, <laughs> but that's tricky. St- where do you stand on the issue of uh, prominent journalists, broadcasters on TV New Zealand, for example, um, plugging stuff commercially on their social media? Well, I can't speak for TVNZ, but I'd say for any journalist, if you've got commercial products or endorsements, then those should be disclosed. And and certainly you should not be producing any editorial content that conflicts with any commercial Even arrangements. Even if it's disclosed, yeah. isn't it tacky? Well, I think it's a reflection of the fact that this industry has way less money than it did. Mm. And there are just commercial... I know people won't like that, and I know people will be listening to that and rolling their eyes. But, you know, I always have to explain to people, journalism is, by and large, in this country, a business. If you were to map out the main players in the media space, they are commercial organisations with shareholders, with dividends to pay, with the exception of RNZ, which is obviously fully funded by the taxpayer, and even TVNZ, which is obviously about to go through a merger. But in its current form, it's a crown-owned company that is expected to pay a dividend to the taxpayer. You know, people talk about it being a state broadcaster as if all the cash is handed to them. TVNZ makes money off advertising. That's the business model. It needs that money to survive in its current form. So... These are the complexities that I think a lot of people don't like. Look, in an ideal world, would would there there'd be no ads on TV, there'd be no ads in the paper, everything would be fully funded. Would people want to pay for that? I mean, those are the conversations we're having now around this merger. Yes. Do New Zealanders really want to pay for that? Do they feel that they, that they need to pay for that? Is it specific kinds of content that we need to fund? And I think the New Zealand on air model, which has always come under a lot of flack, has actually served this country incredibly well over the, the last few decades. You know, it was set up to fund the kind of content that commercial providers or commercial platforms won't fund. Thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of stories have been told over the last however many decades that would never have been told if New Zealand On Air hadn't supported them. You, um, as a journalist, really, it seems to me, specialised in social issues, Mm. big, ugly you know, complicated, meaty meaty is a better word, uh, issues. Um, Why that? Why not press gallery, journo, business editor, or a raft of sports? You've told us why not sports, but why the social issues? And um, how do you reflect Mm. on that? Because you are in contact with real people. And those other disciplines that you mentioned... I've, in my view, you have less contact with real people. You know, I have been to prison a number of times and sat in a cell and interviewed someone. I spent a night inside Gloria Vale. I've covered the Christchurch terror attack and the Sydney siege. I've interviewed survivors of sexual violence. I've um, interviewed, you know, Olympians and people from, from different walks of life who've experienced the good and bad of life. And so when I was growing up, I always thought I'd be a political reporter and I wanted to work in the press gallery. And I worked in, in the newsroom in Wellington for a long time and got to cover a lot of political stories. But I always felt, man, this is a bubble. You know, the, the political reporters, the gallery reporters are good at what they do, but they are so hamstrung by the fact that they are stuck in that building. Most days, the most that they might do is go out and do some vox pops on Lampton Key and ask a few punters what they think. But their job is to cover, in some ways, not even politics, but politicians. You know, they are dictated to by politicians' agendas and events and schedules and trips. 
Whereas I've never really enjoyed that. I think that the gamesmanship of politics, the, the beltway machinations are of very little interest to, shall we say, mainstream New Zealanders. No, I think there's absolutely something in that. I mean, if you reflect on that making, shaping history that you've spoken so eloquently about that journalists can do, what would you say is the most significant work you did as a journalist? The work that I'm most proud of is the men's mental health stories that I did over a number of years. So I had a sort of bucket list when I started on Sunday of the stories that I wanted to do, and I managed to tick them all off during those four years, which was, you know, um, I was really grateful for. Mm. One of the stories that we did was on the impact of uh, online porn on young people, which, again, is just one of those social issues that we're not talking about enough. And we went to LA and we interviewed uh, a young Kiwi who'd been affected by porn addiction and we went to a porn set and interviewed porn stars and Tracy Martin, the minister, was doing a big piece of work around then. So, you know, when you can put a story like that out there and half a million people watch it, you know, you don't see the ripple effect straight away, but you know that there must be a ripple effect from that many people watching it. And look, journalists often, we, we like an exclusive, we like a headline, we like something to happen, we like an inquiry to be announced. That That's all good stuff. But to me, the most meaningful change is actually not the dramatic stuff. It's that a parent or a young person watches a story and it shifts the way that they think. They actually make incrementally better decisions in their day-to-day -day life as a result of what they've seen on TV. And that's not particularly dramatic and you can't really measure it or see it. But I know that the work that we does we do can have that effect, and that probably sounds quite high minded. But I still have a very there's nothing wrong with that and idealistic I, view of what journalism can do. I think do. there's something in there. I I think the political class um, will often think, you know, we passed this law, we did this report, we had this regulation, and that's somehow affecting things. But in fact, you know, it's those deep cultural societal things that are moving. Uh, a nation at a level, and um, that's, you know, I'm not saying politicians are inconsequential, I won't say that as a former one, but but it's it's that, those wider things, and I, I think you're right, a body of work can really um, make a, a significant difference. But I think then... jour journalists can play the game, though, because we feel that we have to get exclusives we have to and, and you know this from politics as well right i mean did that frustrate you the things that you that you felt that you needed to you know politics and media are both about attention yes they're built around how can you hold the largest number of people's attention i think it's certainly speaking as a journalist that conflicts with those ideals because on one hand on a personal level you want to tell meaningful stories you want to make a difference but you've also got to create a product that rates and that people want to watch and that sells and in politics, you know, I know a lot of politicians come in wanting to make a difference, but they find that they've got these constraints around the job that can make that very difficult. Why'd you get out? And in addition to that, you know, do you look back um, and have a sense today that, um, you know, for all the complicated reasons you've gone through, um, journalism is less um, than it was? Well, why did I get out? Because after four years uh, up here in Auckland, I had experienced, you know, really significant depression and suicidality while I was also experiencing the most successful and productive years of my career. And that was very confusing because I was brought up to um, pursue excellence, to do my best, to make a contribution to society. And I felt that I was doing that. And I had incredible opportunities. You know, businesses pay tens of thousands of dollars for, a, you know, a 30-second ad during the news. Mm. But I've been so fortunate to spend most of my um, 20s, the whole of my 20s, being able to have a platform to, to share on topics that are really important to me. But I had to acknowledge that my own mental health was suffering and that wasn't because of my job. It was because of just a sense of disconnection in my life. I hadn't found my place in Auckland. I also hadn't done the work on myself. I hadn't dealt with some of those childhood issues and traumas that I'd struggled with. And even though I'd been to counselling and I'd taken antidepressants and I'd gone to yoga classes and I'd read books and watched TED Talks and done all the other stuff that we expect people to do, I hadn't managed to get into a better space. And so I needed to step away for a while. So that's why I left. Your second question, how do I view journalism now? Do I view it as less than it was? No, I, I think that the industry has changed because the pressures on it have changed.
And I feel upset about that. You know, I wish we were back in the glory days where all of these shows and newspapers had huge audiences and huge budgets and um, they had very um, focused audiences, whereas now the audiences are distracted. The audiences are on a million the audiences are on a million different places online and it's really hard to get them. I, if I was starting out now, I would find journalism as a job way more difficult than I did 15 years ago when I started. And it's not RNZ versus stuff or any other. Um, it's it's all of those versus yeah. TikTok. And, ne- and Netflix and, yes. and all the other platforms that are out there. Yes. Um, I want to talk about mental health. I just, mm-hmm. I just, you know, let's get there. But today... And in recent times, you've written a book, you're a storyteller, you're a speaker, um, you're a facilitator, you're, a, you're an MC. Um, you, you speak on leadership, as we say, mental health, diversity. Hmm. Um, what, what are your, um, I don't want to say happy places, but hmm. what are, what's your ideal kind of role amongst those things that you're juggling? And what's the, yeah. So what I realised when I left full-time journalism was that a lot of people in our country struggle with this concept of storytelling, as we talked about earlier. And I saw an opportunity there to try and distill and share some of those skills that I developed in journalism to actually make people feel more confident in telling their own story. To tell that story internally, so to think about the internal narrative that's actually powering their life, which has a huge impact on your mental health, and also how to share their story more effectively with other people, how to use storytelling in the workplace, how to use storytelling to make people feel more included. So that's what I've spent most of my time over the last three years doing, which has been so rewarding, travelling around the country, meeting people from very different walks of life and very different businesses and organisations, and trying to share some of these practical tools with them. I, um, I, I wonder, and you know, we've talked in a way about this, already but in terms of what you're saying an older generation if I can stereotype hugely would say what you've just said Jahan it all sounds very self-indulgent it's all Mm. me 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 my story my internal process Mm. I'm sharing with you how I feel well there's a whole field of research called narrative psychology Mm. and narrative psychology holds that each of us has an internal ever-evolving story of self. So this is not something that you choose to do. We are storytelling animals. The way that we are cognitively wired is to understand the world, not through data, not through pie graphs, but through stories. Mm -hmm. From a very, very young age, you start to knit the events in your life together into the form of a story. So the first thing I would say is that you can't opt in or out of this. We are all telling stories every day, if, even if those stories are only being told to ourselves, So my question and my pushback against that is, wouldn't you want to be telling a better story? Mm. If, if, if the beneficiary of that is going to be you, if it's going to be your mental health, your sense of connectedness, your sense of purpose, then why wouldn't you lean into that? And mm. I'm sure there's people that think that that's indulgent, but I find that criticism uh, far, and far less common than it yes. used to be. Mm. You've told us, you know, about battling depression and yep. sometimes suicidality. Um, and uh, I think I'm right to say it was a, you know, a several-year, four-year mm. uh, uh, a battle that you had. Mm. Um, what, what's your story on that? And you know, I, I suppose I'm really interested in how you came out the other side. Well, I had done a lot of mental health reporting, and I knew that we had this problem. And growing up, I thought that I was indestructible. I remember as a 16-year-old going to the funeral of one of my classmates who had taken his life during the summer holidays. And the thing that always has stuck in my mind about that was that um, Black Eyed Peas and Justin Timberlake were playing over the church speakers. And I remember sitting there as a 16-year-old thinking, this is messed up. This is so wrong that there is um, Justin Timberlake is, is being played at this funeral. I mean, it tells us that the person who's died is way too young. Mm. And we went back to school after that summer break and no one talked about it. No one was really talking about mental health. I don't remember hearing the words depression or anxiety ever mentioned at school. So then I went into journalism, and I was really interested in this topic of mental health, which is prior to it being a a, a hot topic in the media. And I started reporting on it. And uh, when I was 20 or 21, I went to Kawaro after there was a big spate of suicides there on the East Coast and started interviewing members of the community. And so we were just starting to understand 
what this problem was in our country. Then fast forward a few years after many, many more years of journalism, and I moved to Auckland and I started to struggle. And I thought, well, I know what I'm supposed to do here, which is ask for help, because that's the drum we bang on, right? Ask for help, ask for help, ask for help. And I went to the doctor, um, had counselling for a couple of years, took antidepressants, improved my exercise, improved my diet, cut back on stress, cut back on alcohol, all of that stuff. And I think the problem is we've got all these tools now and the narrative is kind of like you pull these levers, use the tools, and then you'll get into a better space. And I found that that didn't happen. So that was when I decided that I actually needed to have a circuit breaker. And I made that decision to step away and move back to Wellington. And really, I guess what you're asking is, what was the game changer? How did I find a way out of that? And it was this idea of rewriting my own story. Mm. I recognized that my problem wasn't my sleep. It wasn't my job. It wasn't any of these other things in my environment. Mm. It was a toxic and hopeless and dysfunctional story that had been powering my life since I was a kid. A story that said I was unworthy, I was unlovable, that I was a burden to other people. You know, all of those narratives that came from those experiences we talked about that I had as a child. So how I found a way through this was by actually working on that story, by doing some um, internal work. As another way, maybe they're different concepts, but another way of expressing that or thinking about that, you know, this notion of reinvention. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess it Redemption. was... Redemption. It was almost a returning to the the aspects of my personality and my identity that were there before they were corrupted by the world, which is what I think life's hard, you know? Life actually um, can can rough us up. Yeah. And sometimes it's not a reinvention. It's actually a coming back to who am I? And in a circular way, all the way back to that concept of authenticity. What is the authentic version of who, without other people's judgment, without without other people's criticism, without the stuff that's made me feel different or ashamed, who am I actually without all of that stuff? Like, what's the best version of me if I was to strip all of that away? So, and again, for some people, that might might find that all a little bit airy fairy, but that's my answer. That's what I did. And I think it's a great thing, by the way, because I suspect you've got a long list, but and we've talked about some of them today. Mm. You. What do you feel really strongly about? Well, I feel really strongly about the fact that we have a generation of young people in this country who are walking around believing their brains are broken. And that really aggrieves me because I think we have taken a Western physical health model and we've tried to stick that on top of our incredibly complex brains. So where we start this conversation is what's wrong with you? How can we fix you? How can we cure you? And instead, what I think we need to be teaching young people is that life involves suffering. Life involves distress. Every single one of us will experience mental distress at some point in our lifetime. It may involve a clinical diagnosis, but chances are it may not. You know, the whole country has been through some form of mental distress over the past three years with COVID. So the fact that you're experiencing distress does not mean that you are mentally ill, in inverted commas. It doesn't mean that your brain is broken. It means in many cases that you are having a normal human reaction to the circumstances of your life. And regardless of the challenges that you're facing, you you are still the author of your own story. You still have agency in that story. Your decisions still matter. And so what I encourage people to do is, yes, ask for help. Ask for help. Use the professional services that are there. If you need to take antidepressants, for example, and they make a difference for you, go for it. If counselling makes a difference for you, go for it. There are so many great tools there. But at the end of the day, a doctor cannot fix your well-being. Mm. Your your employer cannot change your mental health. You are responsible for your own well-being. And that's something that took me a while to get. What do you think the effect of COVID has been on our mental health? Massive. As a, as a, a generalisation. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people have lives that are built around avoidance. You know, people work incredibly long hours, in some cases, to avoid their family mm. or to avoid their own trauma or to um, rely on 
um, success or productivity or ambition. And COVID stripped all that back. To meet their emotional needs. That's what I found most interesting initially. If you're a business traveler and your life is held together by the fact that you spend three or four weeks on the road being stressed and achieving stuff and having great numbers for your company, what happens when that's taken away? And the interesting thing is the timing of me leaving TVNZ was, you know, I'd taken six months of unpaid leave initially. And I put all my stuff into storage in Auckland because I fully intended to come back. And I thought, I just need a six-month circuit breaker. So I moved back down to Wellington and I rented this little apartment and I was just going to use that time to, to heal, basically. And then COVID hit. But when COVID hit and we went into lockdown, I'd already spent three months effectively detoxing from this very adrenaline fueled life that I'd had for more than 10 years. So I'd almost learnt to slow down. I'd learnt some of those coping skills. And so I'd had a soft entry into it. But I, I watched as other people came crashing down from the day to day busyness and reality of life. And then they were just alone or they were alone with other people, but they were alone with their own thoughts and they had to reassess their life, and that was hugely confronting for people. And I think a lot of people are still trying to work out, what is my life supposed to look like now in this post-pandemic world? So I think it's been very brutal for people, but I also know lots of people for whom they're very grateful for the work that they've been forced to do as a result of lockdowns and COVID that they would never have done mm, if yes. life had continued as normal. On the matter of COVID, you've spoken really well on the... the around COVID and difference. That is, you know, we're so polarised yes. today. You know, whether it's our politics, um, our, our views on health and vaccinations, um, you, you name it. How do, we, how do we bridge that gap between these various factions, really? Yeah, well, I think that comes back to empathy. And in order to have empathy, we have to be willing to step into messy and awkward and uncomfortable spaces with people who are different to us. And, you know, many people would argue that the media doesn't help this because we like to put people into boxes. We like people to be made simple in many ways. You know, are you a hero or are you a villain? Are you someone who's like me or are you someone who's not like me? Can I trust you or can I not trust you? But in many ways, the media just reflects culture, and I think that's what people want. We want, we want shorthand. We don't want complexity. We don't want nuance. And so for me, when I sit down with someone, even someone who I dislike or someone I disagree with, I'm thinking about how can I understand the context of this person's life? What are the events that have taken place in their life that have actually led them to this view or led them to this, this you, place? You've interviewed convicted killers, leaders Absolutely. of glory. Va glory oh, white val. supremacists. Um, do you emphasize, empathize, empathize with them? When you hear someone's story... It changes your perspective on what they've done or who they are. Um, I can't remember who said, I think it was Fred Rogers, the American children's TV host. There is no one you can't learn to love once you've heard their story. And I'm not saying that I have ever fallen in love with a white supremacist, but I've sat with people who I find detestable, to be perfectly honest. And when I've heard about the events that have taken place in their life, I've gone, this doesn't excuse your behavior, but it does explain it. And I think we've got to be better at understanding the difference between an excuse and an explanation. We can still call stuff out. We can still hold people accountable while also recognising what's shaped them. You um, speak a lot about leadership mm -hmm. and, and courageous conversations and, you know, I suppose, courageous leadership. What's leadership to you? Well, the area that I focus on the most is the fact that leaders need to be able to use stories to connect with people if they want to build stronger relationships. And so if a leader's not willing to be vulnerable, if they're not willing to be human, if they're not willing to actually take some risks, then what reason is there for people to trust them? And in politics and in business, there are plenty of people who've managed to get by as leaders without showing any vulnerability at all. But I think we're past that now. I think people have higher expectations of their leaders. And, you know, I interviewed Dr. Anthony Fauci a couple of years ago for stuff mm. while he was at war with President Trump. And I wasn't quite sure how to start the interview, but I decided to ask him about his day. And he told me about how that morning he woke up and he opened his computer and there was the number 
of Americans who had died the previous day from COVID. And I thought, here is a guy who's literally responsible for the health and well-being of millions of people. And I mm. said to him, what is, what is that burden like for you? What is it like for you to actually know that you're carrying that responsibility? Um, and he talked about how he sheds, sheds tears sometimes. He talked about how hard that's been for him. And so there's this amazing moment in the interview where this guy who's been on wall-to-wall CNN, BBC, ABC, saying the same stuff all day, every day, actually opened up. And so those are the magic moments for me. That's what I live for, when I can hopefully create a safe space for a leader or for anybody to show a little bit more of who they are. I mean, and, on, and on the basis of that courageous, authentic leadership um, around telling your true story. Are you a leader? I think we all are leaders. And I think in New Zealand culture would say that you shouldn't say yes to that question because you sound pretentious. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to lead in my little corner of the world. And so uh, I'm going to go and speak at a conference this afternoon with a couple of hundred people there who work in the accommodation sector, who have been hit pretty hard over the last couple of years. That's not a particularly dramatic or grand thing. It's not like being on TV in front of half a million people. But I know that I have a story to share with them and hopefully some tools that will benefit them in their life. So if that's what leadership looks like, then hopefully I'll be able to do a bit more of that. I'm conscious, you know, and you said it yourself, that we are, and, and it, it, for the same reason, with what, what you've just said, you know, Kiwi kind of, oh, that's all a bit high-minded and we're, yeah. you know, pre- pretentious and so on. Who Answer cares? me this. Yeah, I, you know, I agree cares? with you. Uh, answer me this. Do you, outside of that, have um, mundane hobbies? Are you sitting there, I don't know, um, playing Sudoku late at yeah. night? No, or? I'm not sitting there having high-minded conversations about <laughs> storytelling all the time. Um, no, I don't play Sudoku, but actually I spend most of my time in my beloved city of Wellington um, eating, <laughs> e- eating and drinking with um, with close friends. And, yeah. you know, there is nothing better to me in the world than sitting down and having a good conversation with someone who I like. What's the future hold for you? I don't know. I only plan one year at a time. I actually don't believe in goals, and some people will vehemently disagree, because I think goals, it's good to have the specificity of goals. But for me, I've got to where I am today by having campaigns. I heard that word from a friend once, and he says, I don't have specific goals. I'm not going to do X by X date, Mm. but I have a direction. And and he's specific about the direction. I'm taking steps on that campaign Mm. to become a better X or to learn more about X. And so um, I've loved the work that I've done in the last few years. And I'm still, I still see myself as a journalist. I'm doing much less of that now. But um, I'm fortunate to be able to contribute to TVNZ and to stuff and to tell stories that matter to me. But for the year ahead, I see uh, a lot of travel around the country again like this year and meeting people from different walks of life and teaching them about storytelling. We're going to wrap up today mm. with the questions I ask every guest, and we call it general knowledge. What single object would you save from your house? Well, it's quite boring, but I would save my laptop because I am a digital native, and that, that device has my whole life on it. Yes. I have got folders and folders and folders of photos. I have a couple of thousand songs. You know, that is my bread and butter. That is the, that is the most precious What sort of tunes stuff. and beats we talking here? Oh, a lot of sort of chill step, electronica, trip hop, you know? <laughs> Fantastic. What's the best night out you've ever had? A few years ago, I was traveling in Italy with my friends, uh, Tommy and Brooke, and we had a meal at an olive oil resort in Tuscany. And I think the three elements that make a great memory like that are the people that you're with, the quality of the food and the setting. Mm. And I could not fault any of those. I once, here's a sentence you won't hear often, I once once went on my sister-in-law's honeymoon. That's a bit weird. At a Tuscan uh, olive grove. It's very good. We learned a lot about... um, Olive oil and yeah. olives and the you were, you were Hang on, you were on your sister-in-law's honeymoon? Yeah, well, it's not as if they hadn't had sex before and they wanted, you know, they wanted to... Well, what um, were you there for? They, well, I wasn't there for that. I no. went there with, they, let's be, they wanted my wife, uh, Emily's lovely sister, Natalie, to be there in truth, not me. Yeah. And uh, But I tagged along So you went well. for the olive oil. So we were there for the honeymoon. And um, this is relevant because it was... At a, a beautiful olive grove in Tuscany. I haven't had enough of those experiences, I have to say. Mm. Um, what's the best advice given to you and who gave it? My mum once said that relationships are not 50-50. Both people have to give 100%. Yeah, and I, I like think that's that. true of 
all relationships in life, whether it's a business relationship, a friendship, a relationship with a colleague. I think so often we think, I'm going to come to halfway and that's where I'll meet you and I expect you to come to halfway. Yes. And of course, compromise is a huge part of relationships. But I, I do think that where you're able to say, how do I actually just give my best to the other person? How do I give them um, the best version of myself? How do I be generous? If that's reciprocated, mm. then you've got a pretty great relationship. Yeah, 50-50 view of a relationship's a, a bad path. It's quite transactional, down. isn't it? That's exactly right. Um, Jahan, it's been fantastic to have you on. Thanks for having uh, me. Amazing journalist, speaker, storyteller, mental health advocate. Thanks, Simon. You've been listening to Generally Famous. There's a new episode every Wednesday. You can listen to them all at stuff.co.nz slash generally famous or wherever you get your podcasts. In fact, if you follow us on Apple or Spotify, any of the podcast apps, in fact, you'll get the latest episode automatically. Go on, it's really quick and easy. I'd love to hear from you. Send your feedback to generallyfamousstuff.co.nz and if there's a guest you'd really like me to talk to, contact same address thanks to my producers chris reed and jen black i'm simon bridges i really appreciate you listening generally famous is proudly brought to you by trade depot generally famous for low prices always Kiwis are now travelling to Trade Depot, Hamilton Airport, to visit the world's biggest bathroom, kitchen and appliance superstore. Here you'll find thousands of new premium products from world-leading designers and manufacturers. Trade Depot's bulk buying power means you'll save thousands on home renovation products. It's worth visiting Trade Depot at Hamilton Airport, the world's biggest bathroom, kitchen and appliance superstore. TradeDepot.co.nz